Bachman with the best of 96. Started well, didn't it? 1996, the bleak but brilliant Seven, Michael Mann's intelligent thriller Heat, and the wit and elegance of Sense and Sensibility. And then it goes and finishes up with the unpardonable drivel of Jingle All the Way. But hang on, don't abandon hope, for in between times it was still possible to discern among all the fool's gold the occasional glint of the genuine 14 carat item. The aforementioned Seven, the first of my ten films of the year, chosen in strictly chronological order, is a fine example. David Fincher's story of two cops, Brad Pitt and the excellent Morgan Freeman tracking a serial killer, was a chilling examination both of wanton violence and the breakdown of morality in America. But you know, even in those early heartening weeks, it was obvious the cinema wasn't always using the right shampoo, for there was dandruff everywhere. The unnecessary remake of Sabrina put poor Julia Ormond in direct competition with the immortal memory of Audrey Hepburn, which was most unfair. Keanu Reeves turned up as Johnny Mnemonic, more accurately, Johnny Moronic. And what on earth were we to make of Paul Verhoeven's truly awful showgirls? The result, presumably, of too many sweaty hours spent leering at Baywatch in a darkened room with the door locked. But then, to stave off incipient despair, came the second of my top ten, Mike Figgis's Leaving Las Vegas, an intelligent, gripping examination of the relationship between a Vegas hooker, Elizabeth Shue, and a terminal drunk, Nicolas Cage. I remember getting to the casino. <coughs> and I remember kissing you. That was really nice. And going and playing blackjack, and then security came. But after that, everything's a blank. What happened? They wanted to carry you out and dump you onto the street, but I talked them into letting me walk you out. That's impressive. How'd you do that? I told them you were an alcoholic. And that I would take you home. And that we would never go in there ever again. We. Yes, we. It's amazing. What are you? Some sort of angel visiting me from one of my drunk fantasies? How can you be so good? I don't know what you're saying. I'm just using you. Now, around this time, I enjoyed Jean-Paul Belmondo in an updated version of Les Miserables and The Charm of a Little Princess. Othello was notable for Kenneth Branagh's Yargo, but for little else. Spike Lee's Clockers was a disappointment, and so was Martin Scorsese's Casino. De Niro and Sharon Stone were OK, but Joe Pesci seemed to believe the world was desperate for an encore of his performance in Goodfellas, and he was absolutely wrong. 
On the other hand, my third choice, Sense and Sensibility, cleverly adapted by Emma Thompson and beautifully directed by Ang Lee, got it just about right. <laughs> Willoughby. How do you do, Miss Dashwood? I'm very well, thank you. How's your family? We are all extremely well, Mr. Willoughby. Thank you for your kind inquiry. Willoughby! Will you not shake hands with me? How do you do, Miss Marianne? Willoughby, what is the matter? Why have you not come to see me? Were you not in London? Have you not received my letters? Yes, I had the pleasure of receiving an information you were so good as to send me. Say, Quillaby. Tell me what is wrong. Thank you, I'm most obliged. If you will excuse me, I must rejoin my party. Dear me, what a cad. Altogether, Britain had a pretty encouraging year in the cinema with close to 40 films on release, some of them very good indeed. And Jane Austen had a good year too, for later came Emma, the personal triumph for the exquisite Gwyneth Paltrow, for whom somebody should write a ballet called Swan Neck. However, time now for a couple of honourable mentions. Get Shorty with John Travolta continuing his comeback in a delightful version of Elmore Leonard's Hollywood thriller and the powerful, darkly comic Train Spotting, starring Ewan McGregor, as apparently all British films must these days, very nearly, but not quite, made it into my top ten. There was an excellent Vietnamese film in Cyclo, and a nod of appreciation is due to the mould-breaking computer animation in Disney's Toy Story. But enough for the moment of what I liked. What did you like? Well, even if you're not sure, I can tell you, because here's the list of the top ten films at the box office in 1996. Attend Train Spotting, the ubiquitous Ewan McGregor stars in this impressive story of heroin addicts in Scotland. Nine, Goldeneye, with 007 losing little of his popularity in his Pierce Brosnan incarnation. Eight, Jumanji, Robin Williams' first big hit of the year as he plays a fiendish board game. Seven, Sense and Sensibility, providing an Oscar for Emma Thompson's screenplay. At six, Twister, special effects galore, but a pretty dumb story in Jan de Bont's tornado thriller. Five, Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise and a big screen version of the TV series. Once again, special effects save the day. At four, seven, which we heard about earlier. And three, Babe, wherein a pig becomes a sheep herding champion. A film of the year in 1995. Two, Toy Story, technological tunes run riot in Disney's first fully computer animated feature. And top of the list, Independence Day. The effects department scores again as aliens try to take over the Earth, but God bless America, they fail. Now, in the course of keeping a beady eye on the movie industry, you tend, whether you like it or not, to bump into all manner of curious people. Sort of goes with the territory, I suppose. And you know how it is. You've got to be polite. You've got to talk to them. And I do that. I treat them as my equals because I'm no snob. What follows is a few extracts from some of those conversations. We went into the Oval Office and I sat down at the desk. And we were having some photographs taken outside, just like a, a party outing. And... Um, Somebody took a photograph of me, and I did that, you know. And the moment I did that, I thought, that's him. The New York unions are so... Um, I mean, they're better than they were, but they're still unbelievably expensive, and almost prohibitively so. So we only shot half of them, the exteriors here. And uh, it is an odd experience. Um, you know, it's noisy, it's chaotic, nothing... Surprisingly, nothing works. It reminded me a bit of um, filming in Calcutta. Uh, that, you know, the, the camera will be sort of this terrible thing with, with dents in it. And you'll say, well, what the hell's going on? And they, hey, what can I tell you? It's New York.
I make a rule every three years I must come to a hot country in a pair of leather trousers and do a lot of 400-year-old drama. I loathe rushes. I, I absolutely cannot stand them. I just think they're evil and horrible. And, you know, they really make you doubt what you're doing. And I just have found in my personal experience that it's not good to watch them. I've had a lot of interaction with Irish Americans since the film was uh, some, was screened in the press junkets, you know, uh, and it has led to discussion, just the way we're talking about it now, you know. No one has come up to me and gone, oh, God, yeah, yeah. that old stuff, you know. I never expected to end up in Greenwich in a corset, actually, really. You know, I ne really never expected it to happen. And over the, the, the last four and a half years, every time I've finished a movie, I've just gone back and done another draft of the script. So I've got this and learned to use a computer because the first two drafts were scribbled, you know. If you put someone known, well known in, this, in the role of Jake Brigance, who you're used to seeing winning, and you're going to see this guy come out at the beginning, and, and here comes all the conflict, and you go, yeah, but I've seen this guy before. I know he's going to win. I think when you see me, you don't know. First of all, you're, who is this? This guy, he's, I don't know if he's, if he's, if he's going to win, going to lose. I'd always wanted to do a murder mystery until I did Manhattan Murder Mystery. And I'd always wanted to do a musical. And I wanted to do a musical where the people couldn't sing or dance, uh, really. Uh, you know, I didn't want the kind of musical where people would burst into song with these trained voices that had no feeling to them, that were very mechanical and very professional. I sat down and there was a camera here and a camera here and we were going to shoot our singles simultaneously. So there wasn't kind of the warm up yeah. phase. And I sat down and looked up and Bob was gone and Robert De Niro was sitting there and I just about had a heart attack. It's like, <laughs> it's Robert <laughs> De Niro oh, and I. <laughs> and then I thought, tch, 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 you better pull it together, girl. Right then, back to the top ten and passing swiftly over Nixon, Oliver Stone's latest revisionist view of American history, most notable for Auntie Hopkins' fine performance, and what one might kindly describe as the grave mistake of Stephen Freer's Mary Riley, we come to my choice number four, Tim Robbins' Dead Man Walking. Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn in a passionate but balanced condemnation of capital punishment. You are making it so difficult to help you. Do you leave? I'm not going to do that. It's up to you. You want me to go, you say so. Do you ever think about those kids? Hey, it's terrible what happened to them kids. Yeah, especially since it didn't have to happen. And what about their parents? Do you ever think about what you and Vitella did to their parents' lives? It's hard, man, to have much sympathy for them parents when here they're trying to kill me. Well, think about it. Their kids are shot, stabbed, raped, left in the woods to die alone. How would you feel if somebody did that to your mama or your little brother? What would you want to do to them? I'd kill them. I sure as hell want to kill them. I understand them parents calling for blood, but they call for the wrong head. I won't take a lie detector test. And now another honourable mention for Woody Allen's delightful Mighty Aphrodite. Al Pacino was good in City Hall, so were Holly Hunter and Sigourney Weaver in the thriller Copycat. There was an excellent Scottish film in Small Faces. Robin Williams did himself a lot of good with The Birdcage, a remake of La Cage aux Folles, only to shoot himself in both feet later in the year with the deplorable Jack. And for my fifth choice, Ian McKellen turned Shakespeare's Richard III into a cracking political thriller. I never did incense his majesty against your brother Clarence, but have been an earnest advocate to plead for him. You may deny that you... She may, my lord. She may, Lord Rivers, but who knows not, sir? She may do more, sir, than denying that. She may help you to many great promotions. What may she not? My Lord of Gloucester, I have too long borne your blunt upbraidings and bitter scoffs. I had rather be a country serving maid than a great queen in this condition to be so baited, scorned, and stormed at. By heaven, I will acquaint his majesty. Tell him, and spare not. Look, what I have said, I will about it in presence of the king. Before you were queen, yes, or your husband king, I was a pack horse in his great affairs. In all that time, you and your brother here were sympathetic to the enemy. Let me put in your mind, if you forget what you have been before and what you are, indeed what I have been and what I am. 
a bottled spider. <laughs> My dear brother-in-law, in those busy days when now you try to prove us enemies, we followed then Edward, our lawful king. So should she you if you should be her king. If I should be? I'd rather be a peddler. I'm too childish foolish for this world. You poisonous bunch back toe! <clears throat> Five down, five to go. So let's pause for a moment and have a look at this montage of the movie news of the year. The cinematic year also got off to a good financial start. In January, the British box office had its highest grossing weekend ever when audiences spent more than £7 million watching the likes of Seven, Goldeneye and Bane. Early on, too, Michael Mann's heat began a thankfully minor trend for very long films. Others, such as Nixon, Seven and Casino, all weighed in at around the three-hour mark. However, Kenneth Branagh can easily top that. He's recently finished a near four-hour screen version of Hamlet. Which reminds me, William Shakespeare had a pretty good year in 1996. What with Branagh and Lawrence Fishburne and Othello, Ian McKellen's splendid Richard III, which co-starred Robert Downey Jr. and Annette Bening, and Trevor Nunn's interesting but sombre Twelfth Night, with fine performances from Nigel Hawthorne and Mel Smith. Unfortunately, another British comedian, John Cleese, had a harder time. Fierce Creatures, his follow-up to A Fish Called Wanda, was poorly received by US test audiences, and key scenes had to be reshot, so the film will now open here next month. At the Oscars, the award for Best Actor went to Nicolas Cage for Leaving Las Vegas and for Best Actress to Susan Sarandon for Dead Man Walking, while Mel Gibson did the equivalent of the Cup and League double by winning both Best Director and Best Picture for his William Wallace epic Braveheart. Nick Park won his now customary award for Best Animation with Wallace and Gromit in a close shave, and Emma Thompson was a deserved winner too for her adaptation of Sense and Sensibility. The Cannes Festival was a rather low-key event this year, with few stars around and thus more emphasis on the filmmakers instead. A good thing too. Britain did well, with Mike Lee winning the Palme d'Or for Secrets and Lies and Brenda Blethyn being named Best Actress for her role in the same film. David Cronenberg's crash was the bete noire of the festival, though the real controversy blew up later on when Columbia announced that they would give a general release to the film, which deals with rough sex on the hard shoulder after car crashes. Westminster Council banned it from cinemas in their jurisdiction and tabloid moral panic ruled again. National Film Day was on June the 2nd when all cinemas charged a mere one pound admission to celebrate the centenary of the cinema. As the event was a success, should it become an annual event? To help football-weary audiences during Euro 96, cinemas were full of romantic movies, such as Up Close and Personal and Britain's Ben Chaplin, co-starring in The Truth About Cats and Dogs. Later in the year, at the Venice Film Festival, Liam Neeson picked up the Best Actor Award for Michael Collins, which also won the Golden Lion for Best Picture. Oscar nominations in the offing, perhaps? Meanwhile, those perennial Oscar winners, Wallace and Gromit, had an off-screen adventure when Nick Park left them in the back of a New York cab. Mind you, they're only missing for one day, and wasn't the publicity useful? And as the year closes, Evita has finally arrived, with Madonna staking her movie future on the role every actress in Hollywood wanted. Alan Parker directed, and the cast includes Antonio Banderas and our own Jimmy Nail, though not, of course, wearing crocodile shoes. On a much sadder note, these are among the famous people who died this year.
Now then, whatever happened to Quentin Tarantino in 1996? Not a lot, actually. A slender episode in the disappointing four rooms and an old script dusted down for the thriller-come-vampire movie from dusk till dawn. Can the Q have shot his bolt already? Let's hope not. Elsewhere, Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead was a thriller as intriguing as its title. Kids, which suggested that young Americans were all hooked on sex, drugs and general immorality and caused such a fuss at the 1995 Cannes Festival, turned out to be much ado about nothing very much. The one and only, or in her case two and only, Pamela Anderson Lee unveiled her store-bought bosom on the big screen in barbed wire and gave a new meaning to the word Silicon Valley. But, much more encouraging, then came the next in my list of the top ten, Mike Lee's clever, deeply felt and funny domestic drama, Secrets and Lies. She's got some bloke in tow. Is she? A shifty looking bleeder. Walks like a crab. <laughs> Your tea's there. Ta. Do you want a sandwich? No, thanks. I thought we were having. I only see her first thing in the morning. She comes in, grunts, then buggers off to work. You should be glad she's got a fella. I am glad, Morris. I want her to be happy. But I'd like her to bring him round so you she's knocking about with. Just give her a bit of time. You used to bring your girlfriends home. Front of the telly, laugh, drink. You didn't mind me sitting there, did you? What's her name? Never stop talking. Tina. Tina. And the other one wouldn't open her mouth. Maxine. That's it. Dad liked her, didn't he? Nice thighs. And yet, good as Secrets and Lies was, good as train spotting the small faces were, the sad fact is that British audiences aren't much interested in British films. American product is what they want. So for a view of what was happening in America and what, by extension, will soon affect the cinema in this country, here's Tom Brooks' review of the year in the USA. In America, this was the year of Independence Day, a giant beer moth that became a global box office phenomenon. It was the summer's biggest blockbuster, along with the meteorological thriller Twister. Other summer fare included Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible and Eddie Murphy in The Nutty Professor. All these films made a fortune at the box office, but it was formulaic filmmaking that didn't win votes from at least one former studio chief. M my sense of summer was that it was a real disappointment all the way around. I didn't see anything this summer that really made me feel as though there was some real creativity behind it. Or, th or even, even thought, if you will, you know, any sort of intellectual thought. I know how you're feeling right now. Stop it, stop it, don't do that. It I'm was also a summer you. when some of the biggest stars in the business failed to find an audience. Jim Carrey, who was paid $20 million for his role, misfired badly in The Cable Guy. And the comedy Multiplicity, starring Michael Keaton, hardly made a dent at the box office. But this was a year when Hollywood learned it could make a bonanza without paying for stars who charge $20 million a movie. What we're seeing this year is what is every Hollywood executive's dream, to do a big movie without having to pay a star. And there have been a handful of films that have come out, or are coming out. Twister is one, um, about a tornado, uh, Independence Day is another, you know, about an alien invasion. Uh, you've got Dante's Peak coming up, which is a $100 million film about a volcano explosion. All these films are, are event films. They're films that you go to see for the special effects, for the large scaleness of it. You don't go to see them because they're driven by stars. Consequently, every studio in town is now developing an event film. Many of them are disaster pictures like Volcano. Yes, another Volcano film currently in production, in which an eruption in Los Angeles causes mayhem in the streets. This trend of disaster pictures has already hit the screens with Escape from LA. Producers say there are many reasons why, in cinematic terms, Los Angeles is becoming Disaster City, USA. Because it's not really a city. You know, it's not like Boston or New York or Chicago that have very deep history. Um, and probably because we all love LA, we all like to trash it, but we all deep in our hearts really love it and know that it will survive no matter what we do to it. But it was New York's turn at year's end when Sylvester Stallone appeared in daylight, a disaster picture dealing with survivors trapped in a Hudson River tunnel. Director Rob Cohen thinks it's no coincidence these disaster films began to re-emerge in 1996. I think that as we face the end of the second millennium right here, as we face in the year 2000, there's a tremendous, uh, maybe even unconscious uh, uh, concern or thought 
are the, are the Homo sapiens going to make it to the year 3000, or is nature going to just sweep us off the board like the end of a chess game? And I think the disaster film is a very good uh, dramatization of those unconscious fears. For moviegoers, 1996 will be remembered as a year they were bombarded with almost too many movies, especially early on in the summer and now once again at year's end. Since the beginning of November, an avalanche of more than 50 films has hit American movie theaters. For cinema goers and cinema owners, it's definitely a case of overstimulation. In projection rooms around the country, hundreds of thousands of feet of film are being unspooled. With so many films vying for attention, some stars have found it hard to win audience attention. Arnold Schwarzenegger could only muster $12 million in the opening weekend of his Christmas movie. And Shirley MacLaine, who's starring in The Evening Star, the long-awaited sequel to Terms of Endearment, is dismayed that so many films, including hers, are competing for the same box office dollar. It's nuts. On Christmas Day itself, there are five women's pictures opening. That's not fair. I don't know what's wrong with them. Fix it. The big studios are fixing it. This year, Walt Disney announced a plan to reduce its annual film output by 50%. Other studios are also expected to curb production, but it will be a while before any contraction becomes evident. In the meantime, the studios are relentlessly trying to promote and differentiate their abundance of product. They're also busy releasing films they hope will win Oscar recognition before the end of the year deadline. The English Patient is a strong contender, starring Ray Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas. Milos Forman's new film, The People vs. Larry Flint, is getting very strong, advanced word of mouth. There's a small Australian film, it's called Shine, and my feeling is that that is this year's strong, lower-budget, independent contender. Among the late releases are some critically acclaimed films. Not many, but enough perhaps to persuade the beleaguered moviegoer, shell-shocked from the blitzkrieg of over-promoted and over-hyped films, that 1996 wasn't that bad a year after all at the American cinema. Yeah, but why do I still have this feeling that no matter how many films turn up, it'll still be a case of never mind the quality, feel the width. Now, every year has its ups and downs. On the seesaw of life, some rise high while others hit the ground with a spine-jarring clunk, and 1996 was no different. At the end of it, I would suggest that those with their heads in the air include... Liam Neeson, who excelled in Michael Collins, of which more later. Kevin Costner, who returned to box office popularity with Tin Cup. Eddie Murphy, ditto, with The Nutty Professor, which was pretty dire but made a lot of money. Robin Williams, two of whose films, Jumanji and Birdcage, both took more than $200 million. Mike Lee, whose Secrets and Lies was an international hit and opened the New York Film Festival. Mira Sorvino, who won herself an Oscar in Mighty Aphrodite. Ewan McGregor, who turned up in Train Spotting, Brassed Off, and Peter Greenaway's innovative the Pillow Book. Matthew McConaughey, Hollywood's new heartthrob after a time to kill. And Kate Winslet, who followed her Oscar nomination for Sense and Sensibility with an eye-catching performance in Jude. And among those with a badly bruised coccyx, I would include... Sharon Stone, who followed her own Oscar nomination for Casino with the dreary Last Dance and Diabolique, and who, five years later, is still best remembered as the shameless flasher of basic instinct. Francis Ford Coppola, the unforgivable perpetrator of Jack. Robin Williams, the equally unforgivable star of that film, one of the worst of this or any year. Jim Carrey, who was both unfunny and deeply unpleasant in Cable Guy. Steve Martin, guilty of the weary father of the bride too and the ill-conceived Sergeant Bilko. And Demi Moore, who despite earning $12 million and bearing practically all in striptease, succeeded only in whipping up widespread apathy. Time now, though, to get back to my top ten and Fargo, which the Coen brothers allege is based on a true story. Absolute rubbish. It's nothing of the kind. On the other hand, it is the best film the brothers have made yet, a black-hearted comedy thriller with a great performance from Francis McDormand. OK. So we got a trooper pull someone over. We got a shooting. These folks drive by. There's a high-speed pursuit. Ends here, and then this execution-type deal. Yeah. I'd be very surprised if our suspect was from Brainerd. Yeah. And I'll tell you what. From his footprint, he looks like a big fella. You see something down there, Chief? 
No, I just think I'm gonna barf. Jeez. You okay, Margie? Yeah, I'm fine. It's just morning sickness. Well, that passed. Yeah? Yeah, now I'm hungry again. You had breakfast yet, Margie? Oh, yeah. More made some eggs. Yeah? Well, what now do you think? Let's go take a look at that trooper. And so, swiftly on to number eight in my list, John Sayles' Lone Star, which is both a modern western, a mystery story, and a thoughtful portrait of a town and its people at a certain time. Chris Christopherson and Hollywood's new boy of the year, Matthew McConaughey, feature prominently, but the leading role is played by Chris Cooper. Historic occasion, ain't it? Yeah, seems like we have another one every week. Well, Laura and the boys down at the Chamber of Commerce got to keep things humming. Building up tourism, Sam. People come here to catch bass and get laid at the boys' town of Ciudad Leon. You ought to put up a banner, Frontera, Texas, gateway to inexpensive pussy. Well, that kind of talk don't help. Well, I'd rather have that than the 10-foot eye catfish statue. I've got Eddie Richter at the Sentinel to kill that story, Sam. What, the Perdido thing? He agreed it wasn't exactly news. You know, Danny's gonna be out for blood the next time. Well, that's the reason we wanted to talk to you about the new jail. Just so we're all on Come the on, same Come on, we don't page. need a new jail. So that's a matter of opinion. We're already written sales to the feds for the there overflow. There was a mandate in the last It wouldn't election. happen to be your construction company gonna get the bid on building this thing, would it, Fenton? And Jorge, I mean, you wouldn't be thinking about a couple of dozen new jobs to dangle in front of the voters when you run for mayor next election? Damn it, Sam, the people are concerned about crime. Hey, look. I'm not going to campaign against your deal here. But if anybody asks me, I got to tell them the truth. We don't need a new jail. Well, when we backed you. When you backed me, you needed somebody named Dees to bump the other fellow out of office. An odd fact about 1996 is that most of the megastars had a movie out during the year. It doesn't always happen. Here now, though, is a montage of megastars and their movies. How many films can you identify? Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. I'm gonna see the fellas that wrecked my car. Have a little talk with them. I drive a Volvo. Beige one. Why? I have no idea! If I have a heart attack, I hope you know what to do. I will not hesitate. Not for a second. So you do get up. I came here to see you. I look like a fool. You're allowed to make a mistake once in a while. It's much worse than you think. There's been a murder at 232 Alton Drive. Send the police. A dragon would never hurt a soul. Why should I trust you now? Daddy, all I'm trying to say is that scientific breakthroughs are occurring all the time. It's an experimental program. I'd say the results are mixed. Do you care for the artist oh. formerly known as Prince? You should never listen to minstrels. I had a good teacher. The only thing you need to study is your ass. I thought it over. I'll take the job. I work behind the cash register in his first store, in his mm. first 15 stores. You don't deserve her. Brother, you are going down. But she appears to love you. Will you marry me? No, sir. What good would that do? Oh, so that's why I didn't get an invitation to your wedding. I choose to fight back! Don't even think about it, cowboy. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> oh, now, see what you made me do? You should have spotted 22 different films there, and if you miss some, tough, because I haven't got time to tell you what they all were. Incidentally, you might also have spotted a couple of things about this emerging top ten. Only two of the films feature among the biggest money earners of the year. But each of them, whatever the basic theme, be it comedy, drama or melodrama, is about something. Social problems, the social structure, historical events, whatever. And that's probably why they're not among the biggest money earners of the year. Hardly anyone these days, alas, seems to regard the cinema as a place where you go to think. But the very best entertainment always involves the mind as well as the emotions. And my top ten are all based on strong, well-written screenplays, which include text and subtext, plot and subplot, good dialogue and character development. As such, they are rarities in this or any year. As dismal examples of the other kind of movie, those which, as far as one can tell, don't even engage the mind of the scriptwriter, let alone the audience, I now present the top ten turkeys of 1996, as chosen by the entire Film 96 team. At ten, Escape from L.A. Never mind L.A., just show me how to escape from the cinema. Nine, Jingle All The Way, Arnie Schwarzy in a movie so awful it could give Christmas a bad name. 
At eight, safe. Julianne Moore suffers every allergy known to man. The audience is worse off, though. It has to suffer the movie. And seven, diabolique, or to put it more simply, diabolical. At six, strip tease in which Demi Moore gets her kit off and the audience yells, put it on! And five, multiplicity, wherein four Michael Keatons proved to be at least three Michael Keatons too many. Four, Jack, Robin Williams as a boy in a man's body. It's so dire that I don't even like to think about it. At three, Barb Wire, Pam Anderson Lee revealing all her talents, or anyway, both of them. And two, the cable guy, Jim Carrey out, staying his welcome in a film that's not funny, just nasty. But right up there at number one, Showgirls, masturbatory fantasy, lousy script, lousy acting, nice G-strings though. In the summer, we had, as ever, the Megabucks blockbusters, the movies whose success or failure means the difference between profit and loss for the Hollywood studios. I'm talking, of course, about financial success. Artistic success doesn't mean a damn in Hollywood. The best of the blockbusters, though like all of them far too violent, was The Rock, Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage storming Alcatraz to save America. Brian De Palma's Mission Impossible, starring Tom Cruise, wasn't bad either. Eraser, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, was an efficient piece of cold, cynical commercialism. The Cable Guy, with Jim Carrey, never rose higher than distasteful. Jan de Bont's Twister, which presented meteorologists, as it might be Michael Fish, Ian McCaskill and Suzanne Charlton, as sexy, death-defying adventurers tracking hurricanes, had terrific special effects and hardly any story to speak of. And though it was a better movie, much the same might be said of Independence Day, which made more money than anything else all year. Later on, the truth about cats and dogs proved popular, though frankly I still can't see why. Jane Eyre with William Hurt and Charlotte Gainsbourg was well worth seeing. So were Bernardo Bertolucci's Stealing Beauty and the French film Beaumarchais. Bruce Willis was in strong, hard-boiled form in Waterhill's Last Man Standing, and Emily Watson made a tremendous impression in Breaking the Waves. But better than all of these was Mark Herman's Brassed Off, which is my penultimate choice. Pete Postlethwaite, Stephen Tompkinson, Tara Fitzgerald and Ewan McGregor, well of course Ewan McGregor, starred in a funny, impassioned brass band musical which had hard things to say about the way Britain's miners feel they've been screwed by the government. Take money while it's still on offer. Hey, there's a lot of folk out there wouldn't like to hear where you're talking, love. Ah, uh, and they're all as daft as you are. All end up winning out, just like us. Hello. <sighs> late for practice. We'll talk about it later, eh? Later? You'll still be saying later when we're out on bloody street. There's always Mr Chuckles. I can do more than that. Phil! 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 You'll have a wife and four bloody kids in a house nobody will bloody buy. Mortgage up to the bloody hills. Loan sharks on our backs. No bloody money. No bloody job. And what are you going to do? Struggle! Bit clumsy with the crockery, you Sandra. Of course, no cinematic year is complete without controversy, and my tenth and final choice, which we'll come to in a moment, contributed its share. But the biggest, most spurious controversy revolved around David Cronenberg's crash. Now, this is not a nice movie, and I wouldn't recommend it. It's about people who get sexual kicks out of watching and being involved in horrendous car crashes. But the fuss kicked up by hysterical newspapers and publicity-desperate MPs, most of whom haven't seen it but still want it banned, is right out of proportion to the film's content. The protesters have leapt on the emotive bandwagon of family values and the protection of our children. But if they really cared about our children, they'd save their condemnation for mind-rotting rubbish like Jingle All the Way or Jack or The Nutty Professor or the Marlon Brando fiasco, The Island of Dr Moreau. Constant exposure to this kind of film could cause an audience more brain damage than a year's supply of BSE contaminated hamburgers. Crash, by contrast, and whether you're offended by it or not, is at least thought-provoking. I do hope that early in the new year, the British Board of Film Classification will enable it to be shown by giving it an 18 certificate. Nobody has to go and see it. It's not obligatory, but adults should at least be allowed to make up their own minds. However, before Crash was shown, uncertificated, at the London Film Festival, the biggest controversy revolved around Neil Jordan's Michael Collins, the story of the terrorist, murderer, patriot, freedom fighter, what have you, 
who was instrumental in bringing about the partition of Ireland. It's a superb film, graced by a tremendous performance from Liam Neeson, and it is emphatically not a piece of propaganda for the IRA. So what's your game, Mr. Bry? Don't have a game. Why did you give me that list? Why didn't you act on it? The cabinet thinks it's more useful in jail. You obviously don't agree. Look, all I know is you're from the castle, and the castle spies and informers run us through like woodworm. You could play the same game. You're a queer, bloody team. You don't believe me, do you? I'm not sure. What would it take to convince you? You could show me the castle files. I'd never get them out. No? But you could get me in. Jesus, you're serious. You think I'm joking? Does anybody know what I look like? Only me. Pretend I'm an informer. Let me in around midnight. I'd never get away with it. That's sure. Everything's possible if you wish hard enough. No, who said that? You did. No. It was him. Peter Pan. Michael Collins completes my selection listed, I repeat, in chronological order. Other honourable mentions are due to such films as Le Bonheur et dans le Pré, the intriguing Chinese drama The Day the Sun Turned Cold, Disney's live-action 101 Dalmatians, and Alan Parker's Evita, which has so far been seen only in London and properly belongs to a roundup of next year. But in any case, in the list of the top ten, there's only room for ten. And just to remind you, these were the films I chose. Seven, Leaving Las Vegas, Sense and Sensibility, Dead Man Walking, Richard III, Secrets and Lies, Fargo, Lone Star, Brassed Off, and Michael Collins. On the whole, 1996 was a year much like any other, but with this worrying proviso, scriptwriting in Hollywood seems to have hit a new low. The films that made the big money from Independence Day to the First Wives Club via The Nutty Professor and Twister were essentially nonsense, ultra-simple tales with everything on the surface. Any imagination they offered was in the use of technology and effects, not in the scripts. The writing was simply a matter of joining the dots between one thrill and another, one killing and another, one explosion and another, or one pratfall and another. That helps to explain why four of my top ten were British. In them, at least, the writing was good. Let's hope Hollywood can pull itself together in time for 1997. In any event, I'll be back on January the 6th to let you know how things are shaping up. In the meantime, may I wish you all a very happy Christmas and a healthy and prosperous New Year. If you're optimistic enough to take on the 14 million to 1 chance of the National Lottery, I hope you all win. But for now, I'll leave you with this montage of the movies in 1996. Goodbye. <laughs> You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got trouble, and I got them too. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together, see it through, cause you've got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Some other folks might be a little bit smarter than I am Big and stronger too Maybe, but none of them will ever love you the way I do It's me and you, boy And as the years go by A friendship will never die You're gonna see it's our destiny you got a friend in 